the journey of mental health, intertwined with a traditional religious experience, can be tumultuous and transformative. A once cherished faith, with its rituals and beliefs, may become a source of inner turmoil and anxiety. The clash between personal convictions and religious dogmas can give rise to cognitive dissonance, casting a shadow over the desired devotional experience. As the heart wrestles with the discrepancies between faith and reason, a sense of aggravation and frustration simmers within. The unyielding spirit, tainted by resentment towards oneself, becomes a barrier to spiritual growth and emotional well-being. The very foundations of belief seem to crumble under the weight of doubt and disillusionment. In the midst of this inner conflict, the path to healing and restoration emerges through the power of forgiveness. To reconcile with the self is to embrace a spirit of compassion and understanding, paving the way for reconciliation with one's initial desire to know the Bible. It is a journey of self-discovery and inner peace, where the wounds of the past are acknowledged and ultimately healed. To move beyond the animosity towards the traditional religious experience is to cultivate a spirit of forgiveness, not only towards our experience, but most importantly, towards oneself. Self-forgiveness is the key unlocking the door to acceptance and self-love, allowing the individual to embrace their present reality with patience and humility. It is through this act of forgiveness that one can transcend the constraints of the past and step into a future filled with hope and renewal. The act of forgiveness leads to the heart finding solace and the mind finding clarity. The burdens of guilt and shame are lifted, making room for the light of wisdom and understanding to shine through. It is a transformative experience where the scars of the past are transformed into sources of strength and resilience. As we navigate the complex terrain of mental health and religious belief, let us heed the call to embrace self-forgiveness as a guiding principle. Let us extend patience towards ourselves recognizing that our journey towards wholeness is a process. May we stand firm in our truth, yet remain open to the transformative power of forgiveness, which has the potential to heal and to mend all brokenness caused by religion. The narrative of trauma caused by religion is a real one. Although it may seem like an impossible or an unlikely solution, Forgiveness of self is a major step to beginning to embrace a desired devotional experience. This journey of self-discovery is for the recovery of our human and devotional being, where the light of forgiveness illuminates the shadows of the past. May we walk this path with courage and compassion, embracing our inner struggles and triumphs with patience, humility, and gratitude. I am so tired, I am so tired of an experience that I need to give energy for and that is killing my energy for. I am so tired of giving myself to a belief that has never fully resonated with me yet I continue to give energy to it because I'm waiting for it to convert me to it. I am absolutely exhausted I am exhausted from giving myself to a belief that I have to lend, that I have to lend my mind and my energy to from other sources which have never benefited me. But I, I must continue due to relationships, due to my own self-confidence, due to everything that I rest my entire being on, commit myself to even though I know that it is and has been doing nothing for me. And not only so, I know that there is something more to it. So I'm questioning it. It's making me question myself. I'm tired of 
the energy that I'm spending on all of this because I'm not getting the energy back. I'm not getting a response back to the energy and to the response that I'm putting forth. So this is something that I hear all the time. This is something that I hear all the time. And the one thing that is consistent that links every single individual together that has this same feeling, that has this same sentiment is trauma. Trauma. Trauma supplied by, trauma forwarded by a religious experience. This trauma has created within the, that individual person or the individual person cognitive dissonance. Cognitive dissonance meaning that once they are imagining or thinking about their religious experience, they're, they're not able to mix and mash their beliefs with their experience. Their experience is causing a conflict with their beliefs and it's making it difficult. There's a clash. It's making it difficult for anything else to come through into their mind, into their heart that is rational concerning either that experience or concerning that belief. So there is a, a stoutness. There is a stoutness to not move forward in understanding what's wrong. There is a stoutness not to move back for fear of what that will mean to, to them personally, the people that are around them, but also psychologically. What will that mean if I go back? What will that mean if I go forward? This single-placed experience now that the religious experience has led the individual in has kept them on an island on their own, and they're just there on an island on their own, and festering within them is resentment, Sorrow, frustration, confusion, cognitive dissonance, and trauma. There is an epidemic that I have been noticing. An epidemic that I have been noticing in this epidemic is unforgiveness with self. Unforgiveness with self. And that's, that's cool in, 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 you know, outside of the scope of where I'm going. Because there are a lot of things that we do to ourselves and that we put ourselves through that we have to be able to accept forgiveness for. But for the, the genre that I'm in, the realm that I'm in, the individuals that reach out to me, this lacking of forgiving self has everything to do with the rooted foundational religious belief. There is something connected to, there is something connected to an unforgiveness and the religious belief. One, one is not happening and one is not allowed to happen. What is not, one is not allowing themselves to have the religious, religious belief due to this, uh, this, this feeling of necessary unforgiveness. And one is, is experiencing this necessary unforgiveness because they're not able to fathom their religious belief. And so what's going on is that there is a circle of tiredness, a circle of tiredness that the individual is experiencing, and for good reason. They're experiencing that circle of tiredness because they're running away. The self is running away from the obligation, the necessary obligation to take responsibility and accountability to, first of all, forgive itself to forgive itself. Alleviation from the trauma that is felt takes place when willingly accepting that the experience as it may appear is what it as is what is it is appearing as which is false but also that the feeling that is being felt from what that religious experience is appearing as it's also right and it's also justified. A fear to acknowledge these things and everything else surrounding them, that leads to a feeling of tiredness. And, it, and that tiredness leads to dissonance. And that dissonance leads to a, a stalling of the devotional experience to where the devotional character is not growing and is not receiving the type of intellect that it needs in order to benefit the human being. And in return, the human being is not growing. Because our human being, despite what it may seem like, is us simply being a body of chemicals, which we are not. Our human being is motivated by a mind unseen within us. 
So when that mind unseen within us is not firstly taken care of, our human being will also not be taken care of, nor will we care for to take care of it. So there's a circle there, and the one thing that stops the taking care of the human being, what gets in the way of that, from the conversations that I'm having, and I'm seeing this trend for the past years, since I made my work public in 2017, same conversations, same problems continue to surface, and that is the religious experience. The religious experience is holding back the conscience of the conversation's care and need to discover its character. This is causing supplied and continually advancing supplied trauma to the devotional conversation, which is unknown because what's reacting is the human being. The ultimate one suffering, the ultimate one sorrowing and crying is the conscience, the character, conscience and the character of our devotional conversation. But what comes out on the surface is the pain that our human being feels and that pain can turn into a lot of things while within us, our inward person is shriveling and not receiving the type of attention and experience it needs and it knows that it needs to be receiving. You know, we turn to what we turn to for reasons. We turn to what we turn to for reasons. We put our belief in what we put our belief in for reasons maybe not even known to us, but ultimately for a sort of not wanting to acknowledge the me that is within. Whatever's going on within, there is something that we must use, that we must use, and that we must do or have in order, in order for us to not see the us that we know we need to see but to just level off, to just level off what we imagine so that we can continue living our basic life. This causes trauma and stress to everything that is us. And this trauma, this stress, it is due to being unrelenting when it comes to the pursuit of forgiving self. It's caused by, like I'm, I'm seeing this epidemic of unforgiveness, being unforgiving towards self. The trauma that is induced, the stress that is caused, it creates a sort of backdrop where the anger blocks out the level of intellect that we need to give to our experience. The frustration, the anger, the fear, the confusion, everything along those lines, the dissonance, blocks out to where we know we need to take our experience but are not willing to. The first the first thing that needs to be done is forgiving self. Why? What why is this the first thing that needs why is a forgiving a forgiveness of self? Why is an unforgiving spirit unhealthy? Why is the forgiveness of self necessary? First Unforgiveness is often a core component of stress resulting from an interpersonal offense. And stress is associated with decreased mental health. Second, unforgiveness resulting from intrapersonal transgressions may increase levels of guilt, shame, and regret that in turn negatively impact one's mental health. Forgiveness may be one way of coping with interpersonal and intrapersonal stress in a fashion that promotes positive adjustment. That's really what the individuals that I'm, the conversations due to the kind of content that I put out, have with individuals, the journey that they're having is a journey that they're finding is stalled. And I want to, I don't want to just hold it to, in, to conversations that I've held. I want to put this, let's just make this broad. Let's just think about you, let me think about me. This is a, ref, this is a, a reflective sort of situation here that is not just isolated to any one individual. We all go through this, whether it is in the realm of philosophy or religion or in our secular lives. 
the the idea of not wanting to forgive self is an idea or is is a notion that takes place due to something that we are experiencing that is causing an offense within ourselves so not wanting to forgive myself i'm so offended at myself i can't think to do so so there must be some sort of emotional outlet that i can use to not do that because of the shame and the guilt that i feel for the need to express to my own self and to take within my own self my own hand and move forward the battle is 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 going on within and there's a conflict the conflict within the conflict within is a conflict of identity. And I'm sticking to the realm here of which my work is related, the identity of our devotional conversation. The identity of our devotional conversation. The more that we have taken beliefs, the more that we have take, taken in theories, the more that our mother and father has influenced us, the more that expert has influenced us, the more that scholarly article has influenced us, the more that the books we're reading has influenced us, the more that our own untrained opinion untrained opinion mean meaning not actually from within the scriptures through a living and personal experience with them the more all of that is causing a bit of stress and trauma within me because i'm not doing all of that i am doing all of that i'm doing a mix of the two and there's there there's tension now there's tension that i'm feeling sorry about myself for and guilt and shame because my experience now dictated through outlets when i know that i myself i should be the, the main outlet for that the initiative isn't there for some reason the care isn't there for some reason something's not there and now i'm re i have been relying on a religious experience to get me to where i know i need to be and it's not it's not i'm not willing to accept that i'm lying to myself and all of every all of that just causes an overflowing of an abundance of stress and trauma to the experience and to the person there is a, a level of healing that's necessary and this level of healing for whatever reason maybe we know maybe we don't this level of healing we're not embracing it and by not embracing it we are creating to ourselves an energy that is not allowing us to move forward practically but at the same time, we are remaining in what's behind us, impractically. And so the result is that we hurt. The result is that we are stressed. The result is that I have a religious practice that's going nowhere and I'm tired and I don't know why. I need help understanding how to move on. But the one way to move on, the one way to move on is to acknowledge the experience in and of itself for what it is. And then to understand that we are not the cause of it. To understand that there is a level of repentance that we have to give toward ourselves for enduring an experience that we know that we are better than and worth more of, worth more from. And to move on in a way that is practical and that doesn't necessarily involve us moving alone, but with a guide. Want to know about an efficient way to study the Bible? In just a few seconds, I'll show you how. Introducing Bible Gateway Plus, your ultimate Bible study companion. With a subscription, you get access to premium resources and tools. Imagine exploring the Bible with commentaries and study notes at your fingertips. Bible Gateway Plus integrates everything seamlessly. Want to dive deeper into the Bible? It's simple with exclusive content like dictionaries, devotionals, and more. Enhance your personal relationship with the Bible today. Sign up for Bible Gateway Plus and transform your study routine. Because Bible Gateway is our sponsor, be sure to use the affiliate link to secure your discount. Happy studying, and may your journey be blessed. Turning to the Psalms, Psalm 130. Psalm 133 through 5. If thou, Lord, shouldest mark iniquities, O Lord, who shall stand? But there is forgiveness with thee, that thou mayest be feared. I wait for the Lord my soul doth wait, and in his word do I hope. Pointing this verse out because I want to pay attention to the characteristics surrounding forgiveness within it. From forgiveness, fear is born or created. And the fear that is born or created 
The fear that is born or created is a respect of the inward person to wait. Forgiveness advances fear. Fear advances respect. Respect encourages one to wait. This waiting is an act of encouraging one to venture into the scriptures to develop a certain hope in its particular message. I'm pointing this psalm out because I want to articulate the result of forgiveness. The result of forgiveness is first fear, which fear is another term for respect. Secondly, waiting, which is a concept whereby the mind, after experiencing the alleviation that comes with forgiveness, is encouraged to patiently dip into and experiment with the scriptures for thirdly, an understanding of a message to exercise hope in. The alleviation to the stress that is felt. All we have to do, all we have to do is put ourself aside, is put ourself aside and let everything that we have as it pertains to whatever we believe let the scriptures have it. Why? Because forgiveness leads to fear. Now, we may not be in a state of forgiving ourselves yet. We may not even know that we need to forgive ourselves for the experience that we have been giving to both our devotional being and our human being. We may not know. But the the character of the verse of this psalm that I'm pointing out here is a character whereby associated to forgiveness is the advancement of fear. That's the point I want to bring out here. We are unforgiving toward ourselves, And we are unforgiving toward our experience because we have no fear, which is not fear as in trembling. This is fear as in respect. We have no respect. We have no regard for ourself. And for the actual experience that our character, both human and devotional, needs. If we can receive and acquire the level of fear that is necessary for forgiveness, we will be able to move forward in our experience, realizing the past, the present, and the future of what should be concerning the character, the thought, the feeling, the actions, and behaviors of our devotional conversation to be and to possess the type of experience we need to have. This will limit the kind of stress that we have been known to experience. This will diminish the level of trauma that we have been known to experience because we are now making sense of that trauma and that stress. All from doing one act. All from doing one act. And even if we don't realize it, if we don't know that we need to, forgiving ourselves for the purpose of having fear. For the purpose of having fear. A respect, not for the devotional experience. We don't have that yet at this point in time. Not for respect toward a religion. We don't have that anymore. That's what's been causing our trauma and our stress. A respect not for anything, not for any agent, other than for our own self, devotionally, for our own self as a being. Having that level of respect, whether we know we need to give it to ourselves or whether we don't, to just, to just give that to us, whatever percentage is, is we can, to just give ourselves to that, give that to us. And then to take our experience, don't take light of it, don't think too heavy of it, put it to the side, let it be what it is, but bring it into the scriptures, anything, anything to verify the belief that we know that we have so that we can have a source and a substance from that source to experiment with. We're doing so for the purpose of fear or respect or regard. Both for the experience that we had, 
even though it has been very traumatic to us, we're making sense of it, but also for the experience that we know that we will have once we continue to allow ourselves to patiently employ forgiveness toward ourselves. Our belief has been serving a message that has not been serving us. Our experience has been serving an experience that hasn't been serving us. The frustration and the stress that comes from that is paramount because we are neglecting ourselves and we are hiding ourselves from ourselves to have an experience that we are wanting to convert us to it. That's wrong to us and should be mentally, and we know it is. Nobody has to tell anybody that this is wrong. This is mental abuse that we are doing to ourselves. Pure and sincere mental health. Pure and sincere mental health appears through positively enforcing fear to our belief. Again, not fear as in afraid, not fear as in harm, fear as in respect or regard, fear as in awe. That can only happen through, first of all, willingly, whether we know it or not, having enough strength, having enough strength to look beyond the experience we've had to envision an experience that we know we should be having. The ability to forgive is thought to be positively associated with personal control in one's life and the restoration of a sense of personal power. Evidence is beginning to emerge in support of this relationship. Internal locus of control or perceived personal control refers to an expectation that outcomes are influenced by one's actions. That means that we have to, for the sake of our mental health, for the sake of the mental health, not necessarily of us, because what affects our mental health is firstly affecting the mental health of our devotional conscience. Our devotional conscience needs to understand the level of control, responsibility, and accountability that it needs to have over its experience. That's that's rule number one. We have to understand that, is that our breakdown of mental health is occurring because the negligence given to the mental health of our devotional conversation. For those of us that realize and that understand that this life is not a life of chemicals and elements, atoms and such, and to where every, every element, to the finite, material contained within every atom is a substance, is a substance reverberating and echoing invisible sound, waves. And to us understanding that and then understanding that whatever we devote our waves to causes a reaction against the being of our human seeing that what is going on in the wavelength, frequency, vibration of everything that we believe or that we are wanting ourselves to believe, that it is not returning the same vibration, frequency, and energy, and wavelength back to us, well, something needs to be done. And the longer we put off doing something is the longer that we continue to believe, we, will not, we may not realize it, but that our life is not our own. We have no control over it then we're going to begin to do acts with our bodies that will allow us to feel some sort of control over our life. When in reality, the issue isn't a control that is physical. We're looking for a mental control through a physical act. In reality, the battle is mental. When we can gain the mental control, we will be able to control more, more competently our physical. Forgiveness may be viewed as a developmental process, including degrees of forgiveness, which can be measured according to the degree of genuineness. Genuine forgiveness requires compassion, benevolence, and love for the offender, together with relinquishment of the right to revenge, resentment, and indifference. 
it is evident that forgiveness is important as a possible repair mechanism for the conflict that occurs in relationships. And now I understand that what I'm reading here is you can hold this to any sort of thing, but I'm holding it to the context of the dynamic between the devotional conscience, the devotional being, and the conscience of the human or the being of the human. This is the relationship that's going on here. The relationship between the devotional conscience, the devotional being, and the being of the human or the human being. The relationship involves at, at that center point there, a level of forgiveness to the individual experiencing trauma from religion, to the individual experiencing trauma from opinionated religion, whether that be self-cultivated or inherited. The battle is within. The battle is within and the battle has to be genuine. Now, Bible gave us what genuine forgiveness looks like. Genuine forgiveness, what it looks like is Moving on, once you may or may not understand that you need to, but still having the strength to, forgive, fear, fear, wait, wait, hope, hope, understanding to exercise. Forgiveness actually looks like the regaining of mental health. When you have actually entered into a state where you have forgiven yourself, you're entering into a state of mental health that looks like a regaining of understanding. Understanding of experience, the living experience, and understanding of self. The result of forgiveness. The result of forgiveness is the regaining of intelligence. The regaining of intelligence. Intelligence philosophically, but most importantly, because all of this affects this realm, emotionally the regaining of intellectual philosophical intelligence, and the regaining of emotional intelligence. This is what true, genuine, and pure forgiveness looks like toward ourself. And when we are initiating it, when we are initiating that level of forgiveness and that experience, you know, there, there is no doubt that what we will return to and what we will capture as we are capturing or wanting to capture what we envision to be for a right experience. Understand the deeper meaning behind the crucifixion and resurrection of Jesus. Discover an allegory that speaks to personal and intellectual devotional growth. Meet the Dawn of Devotion, a sacrifice for devotional evolution. This book challenges traditional interpretations of Jesus' resurrection and crucifixion. Explore the allegorical journey reflecting personal and intellectual growth. Experience a narrative that transforms your understanding of devotion. Get your copy of The Dawn of Devotion, a sacrifice for devotional evolution today, and begin your resurrection. So let's go through some examples. Uh, how can this be applied practically? So let's say that I am a consumer of spiritual, religious, philosophical content. And I'm understanding that it's getting in it's getting in the way of life, secular, family, whatever, but also my own personal reflective experience with the scriptures. And with that, I believe is higher than myself. However, we want to term that for whoever we are and wherever we are in our journey. Let's say that's the experience. Let's just give that example. What do we do? if we are going to be able to allow the Bible to be something to educate us on how to refine our stance and how to realize that the, the things that are going on, they're, they're greater than ourselves in, in terms of the effect that it is having, the negativity, the response, the negative response that it is having on us and the people that are around us. Just looking at the book of Ecclesiastes, Ecclesiastes 1 in verse 8, all things are full of labor, man cannot utter it, the eye is not satisfied with seeing, nor the ear filled with hearing. So that's that's easy. That's easy. We can, as, as we dip into this, the issue that in the example that I, I presented with is that our desire for consuming religious and spiritual content and material 
and are realizing that that consumption is not benefit benefiting us or the people around us through how it is benefiting us, how does the Bible, in a sense, if we had to take all of that to the scriptures, what can the Bible do for us? How can the Bible impact us? Ecclesiastes 1a, all things are full of labor. No one can actually talk about all of how much all things are full of labor. Better translated is the eye is not satisfied with seeing, nor is the ear filled with hearing, meaning that no matter what, there will always be a desire to consume. Human beings are consumers. Human beings being consumers, that's just what it is. That's just who we are. There has to be a level of understanding to cut off and moderate. If we are going to have that type of experience where we are not actually happy being isolated with the scriptures and letting the scriptures be our full guide, weaning down the things that are getting in the way to regain the type of mentality that we need to have. Or Ecclesiastes 3, 1 through 4. Ecclesiastes 3, 1 through 4. To everything there is a season and a time to every purpose under the heaven. A time to be born and a time to die. A time to plant and a time to pluck up that which is planted. A time to kill and a time to heal. A time to break down and a time to build up. A time to weep and a time to laugh. A time to mourn and a time to dance. So we have to be able to understand that something is wrong and that there is a lack of temperance. It may be a better word. There is a lack of temperance in how we are handling our experience. Temperance, moderation. The advice that the scriptures would give to an individual that is steeped, heavily steeped in realizing that they are experiencing no benefit to the things that they are heavily steeped within, moderation. Because if you can understand that wisdom from many years and generations hasn't changed, that the human being is a consumer, that the essence or the nature of the human being is a consumer, and also that there is a time and that there is a place for everything, the ability to get our mind focused, to separate necessary from unnecessary, that takes discipline, that takes time, that is, that is the self-will that is needed for that. The Bible can't put self-will in anybody. All the Bible can do is give us wisdom. What we care to do with that, that's our business. The Bible can only give wisdom. How we employ that wisdom is our business. Bible wisdom, judge moderately, because eventually, eventually, that moderation of putting something to the side and only dealing with what your issue is, that's going to eventually lead to you not really caring about what you've put to the side and you caring about what the issue is for you. And then without even needing what's on the side, you're going to automatically recall or recount whatever it is you're putting to the side to make sense of it practically. So the Bible, in essence, overall wants to give its student intelligence that is reflective for its own self. The individual experience, the individual human and devotional experience is really all that the Bible sincerely cares about. On the surface is another story. When you get beyond the surface and look at the allegory to everything that the Bible's illustrations are pointing to, it's pointing to an individual experience for you and for the wisdom that is within it, for that wisdom that is within it to refine what is in the you. When the you now has what is within there, the you now has something to reflect its own self against. And that reflection is an exercise that goes back and forth for the gaining of understanding. And it is this gaining of understanding that is a sign of personal forgiveness. Because the end of understanding is the conjuring, the development the gain, the growth of a particular message suitable to the individual here in that moment for what they are getting themselves into concerning the scriptures and how they're exercising themselves therein. Staying on that theme of moderation, looking in the book of Philippians. Philippians 4, 10 through 12. But I rejoiced in the Lord greatly that now at the last your care of me hath flourished again, wherein you were also careful, but you lacked opportunity. Not that I speak in respect of want, for I have learned in whatsoever state I am therewith to be content. I know both how to be abased, and I know how to abound. 
everywhere and in all things I am instructed both to be full and to be hungry, both to abound and to suffer need. What we're reading in these verses, we're reading the character of someone that has gone through an experience of self-forgiveness. We're reading the character of someone that has gone through self-forgiveness and we can understand that. We can understand that due to the level of moderation and contentment that they are harping on. The individual that is not content, the individual that is excess, is an individual that is without forgiveness. We can know so due to the abuse that they are giving to themselves. Whatever level of abuse that is, let that be whatever that will be, that self-abuse is due to a trauma-induced unforgiveness. Not able to forgive themselves has allowed them to feel the desire to be excess. So we have to be able to get to that root. No matter what percent of strength that we have, let it be 0.5%, 1%, 2%, no matter what that is, if we can manage to give ourselves that stamp of approval, despite the confidence we have in ourselves, to simply just forgive, don't even... It may make no sense. We may not even know that we need to forgive ourselves, but to just do it and understanding that. And even if not understanding why, jumping into the scriptures and allowing that to be our guide, because no matter where we jump into, it will be for us. No matter where we are opening up to, we will retain something that is for us. What is for us, we have to be able to exercise that patiently and temperately. Because we don't realize that the level of mental health that our devotional conversation is lacking, it's lacking due to us not taking the responsibility and the accountability to forgive. To forgive the past experience, to forgive the present experience, so that we can be able to envision an experience in the future, in the near future, in the present future, that we can stand by and that we can take responsibility for and accountability for. There is a positive effect. The positive effect to forgiveness is understanding. Understanding a particular message that's just for us. Participants from a review of an experiment on how forgiveness and self-forgiveness plays a role in the development and growth of self. Participants said that forgiveness contributed greatly to their personal growth. They had become more open, less rigid, and emotionally stable, developed overall relationship satisfaction, and attained a sense of purpose and meaning in life. I have changed a lot, said this individual. 70% well-being has been achieved. Earlier, I used to blame myself. Now I understand that it might be because of the situation or other people. I am more in control of my thoughts. And I accept that everybody has some positives in them, so I accept them unconditionally. Forgiveness had played a role in managing myself and others. I mean, look at that. Forgiving self, instead of casting blame, instead of casting blame against situation, instead of casting blame against other, instead of ignoring the signs of what self-harm were, the act of forgiving self led to rationalizing treatment of self. This is so key and this is so important because so often a past religious experience is seen as dictating the present and the future religious experience and that's absolutely not the reality. Being able to know that, first of all, our experience is due to how we feel and being able to check how we feel. Being able to check how we feel, to not judge our own self and to not get too low on ourself, to check how we feel is an investigation, is an investigation for the purpose of experimenting with the type of character that we may not have right now, but that we know we need to possess. That's the regaining of mental health. That's the regaining of control. The, the regaining of, of control over the devotional experience. The trauma caused by religion, the, 
The cognitive dissonance that 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 can produce is an experience caused by the fact that I'm giving control over an over to an experience that has not benefited me and I'm continuing to do so even though I know that it's not positive. The type of stress that that causes is the type of stress that causes enemies, not simply just the self, not simply just of the philosophy that's in the scriptures, but to everyone that is around us. Making sense of what has happened in the past concerning our experiences, that allows us to create a way for a vision that we can cast, for a vision that we can cast of how our devotional experience should be. That gives us a goal to attain. We've had no goal to attain. The only goal we've had to attain has been the goal of doing a ritual for something or believing in some idol or believing in something or believing in someone. When in reality, all of that causes so much hatred and resentment within us that we don't want to insult them and we don't want to insult our belief. So then we, we turn and decide to insult ourselves. Our mental health is depreciating the more that we remain in whatever practice that we have and knowing that it should be better, or the more that we do not acknowledge the intended practice we should have after knowing that what we have been in is complete trash. There is a positive effect, and that positive effect is the regaining of cognition for both the personal and the devotional mentality. Ever wished you could master a new skill from the comfort of your home? Skillshare offers thousands of courses taught by industry experts. Whether you're into design, writing, or photography, there's something for everyone. Discover your passion with engaging, hands-on lessons. They are accessible anytime, anywhere, with a paid subscription. Perfect for creative minds and budding entrepreneurs alike. Get inspired by real-life projects and connect with a vibrant learning community. Why wait? Start unlocking your potential today. Sign up for Skillshare and dive into a world of endless possibilities. Because we are sponsored by Skillshare, click the link in the description below and get 30% off on membership. Begin mastering your creative journey today. Now, if we have to ask the Bible on where mental health comes from, it will send us to Job. Many places it can send us to, but it will send us to Job. Job 28, 28, and he said unto man, Behold, the fear of the Lord, that is wisdom, and to depart from evil is understanding. From Job, it will send us to the Proverbs. Proverbs 1 and 7. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge. But fools despise wisdom and instruction. Fear is best understood as having wise regard or intelligent respect. Four, wise regard and or intelligent respect for, meaning even though we have been in a stress-induced devotional experience, a, a, a traumatic religious experience, our regard, our wise regard or intelligent for that experience is the means whereby we can begin to account for the wisdom that we need to come up from out of it. That means there is a level of self-acceptance that we need to foster in order to move forward in the, the stages of forgiveness and growth that the Bible is, is harping on. The moment forgiveness is initiated is the moment that fear is acquired. When fear is acquired, wisdom, knowledge, and understanding is acquired. Wisdom, knowledge, and understanding is acquired through an investigation of self and the scriptures and then of a joint investigation of the two together. The positive outcomes of forgiveness include the improved sense of self-acceptance too. Most participants agreed that they possessed a positive attitude toward themselves and felt content about past life. Participants spoke about the ways they looked into themselves. They took time to reflect on their performance and the impact of their forgiving behavior. For them, reflection was an ongoing process. When I look back, says a participant of this experiment on forgiveness, 
I am quite pleased with how things have turned out so far for me. I have analyzed each situation rationally, responded appropriately without making any effort to react intensely, and tried to manage my emotions even when I was going through different situations. Continuing, practicing forgiveness may reap such benefits that the person develops strength and optimizes the talents to deal effectively with life's challenges. Participants opined that practicing forgiveness helped them to develop competency to appraise the difficult interpersonal situation more realistically and use effective coping strategies. This involved accepting responsibility for solving the problems seeking accurate information about problems, developing action plans to solve the problems, and having an optimistic view of one's capacity to solve problems. Some of the participants reported that they make conscious efforts to minimize on personal threats by taking responsibility and control the situation as much as they could. Some of the participants reported that they made conscious effort to minimize on personal threats by taking responsibility and control the situation as much as they could. That's the goal. The goal of arising from the epidemic of unforgiveness is, is the goal of problem solving. The stress that is occurring from past and present religious experiences is a stress issue that has to do with a feeling of not being in control. And with a feeling of not being in control of what you are lending to your beliefs. See, each and every single one of us give to our belief whatever we do. There is a very personal reason why there is confidence placed onto the Bible. There's a very personal reason why known only to us. Somehow along the way, we in turn forget that as we become immersed in the theological discourse and in the quote-unquote expert theories that are out there and that will inflame, due to its tantalizing sound, the human being. Underneath all of that is the innocent and genuine reason, albeit now forgotten due to what we are taking in for while we have turned to the scriptures. We have turned to the Bible because there is a sense of not having control in our life. We have turned to the Bible because there is a problem that we cannot solve that we trust after hearing something in it, it can solve. Somehow, some way, we end up losing our intelligence and forgetting the genuine reason for why we thought that this book had something tremendous within it. Bible's goal, Bible philosophy, is to get the mind and the intellect back to the genuine purpose for why it thinks there's something special about the things that are within the Bible. When it can, it will no longer think so, it will know so. The reason that there is this prevailing stress and this this tiredness with the belief and the experience and the denomination and everything that's going on is due to the fact that the problem that we thought that the Bible could solve, it's not solving. It's not solving because we're not giving energy to it. We don't realize it. We think we are from the outlets that we are taking in, but we're not. We're only creating harm to our mental devotional health, which in turn creates harm to our mental personal health. We have to be able to step aside from the experience, realize the, the, what we're feeling, the pain we're feeling, the sorrow that we're feeling, and we have to be able to rationalize where that's coming from. We may be able to rationalize where that's coming from, but now we have to accept where that's coming from. Accepting where that's coming from, that is involving forgiving forgiving the ones that have placed that experience onto us, forgiving us for allowing someone to put that experience onto us, forgiving, forgiving ourselves, them at the same time or it at the same time, whatever them or it is, 
But the major forgiveness should go to us because we have been neglecting us. We have been neglecting us. We are not, we are not having our problems solved and that's where the stress is coming from. Bible wants the individual to solve those problems with no agent, with no expert, with no theory, with no nothing. When you were born, who took that first breath for you? Think about that. Who took the first breath for you when you were born out the womb? That's our devotional conversation. When we are allowing it to get cut out of that womb, it has to breathe for itself. There is stress because our conversation is not breathing for itself and it wants to. But that involves a personal fear, not fear as I've been saying, but this is fear as in trauma now because it's very scary to allow our personal devotional conversation to breathe on its own with no life support. But it's the life support that's causing us stress and trauma. So there's the dilemma. What are we going to do with that dilemma? Well, whatever we do with that dilemma, that will determine the outcome for how we envision our experience going and the capturing of what is envisioned. Bible wants mental health. Bible wants mental health. Bible philosophy wants mental health. And where we see mental health lacking, where we see it being deprived, we have to take cards to investigate it. Because it will not just be that our human being is unhealthy. Our unhealthy human being stems from our devotional conscience not having the type of health and well-being that it needs, both mental and emotional. 